In 2006, television actor Allison Mack attended a two-day Nexium motivational coaching seminar. By 2015, she was a leading figure in Nexium founder Keith Ranieri's women-only subgroup, Dominus Onsequius Sororium, or DOS, where she led efforts to have members branded with her initials just above their pubic region. In order to join DOS, women had to provide nude photos and various other compromising bits of information which Mac and Ranieri used to blackmail them into having sex with Ranieri and then force them to perform tasks for group leaders. Mac was arrested and pled guilty to racketeering, extortion, and forced labor. She faced up to 15 years of prison time and released a letter calling her involvement with Nexium the biggest mistake of her life and offered to help with the prosecution of Ranieri. The judge ordered her to three years of prison time and three years of probation, as well as 1,000 hours of community service and to pay a $20,000 fine. What would make a reasonably successful, reasonably bright, reasonably attractive woman in her mid-30s commit such horrendous acts of emotional and physical abuse? Mac was only the point of a pyramid of abuse, with underlings performing similar actions to women further down the triangle. Perhaps Nexium leader Ranieri had gotten inside their heads. Perhaps they had been brainwashed into serving him. This is a common conclusion that people often jump to in cases of cult activity or cult-like abuse, but it's a red herring. We're, we're tempted to say people aren't capable of doing things like this of their own free will. We'd rather think that rare, aberrant sociopaths simply twist their minds into doing horrible things. We don't want to believe that people who look and act a lot like us can behave so irrationally. But they do. Although Mac likely wouldn't have branded or blackmailed women if she'd never met Ranieri, she also chose to do all of these things of her own accord, which is what made her legally responsible for her actions. As for her victims, no matter how they attempted to justify their membership in DOS to themselves, blackmail and coercion were necessary to keep them in the organization, which suggests Ranieri was not especially successful at controlling their minds. Mac was guilty because she was acting of her own free will, and she's repentant for the same reason. Today, on Occult Confessions, I dispel the myth of cult brainwashing. Here with my favorite cultists, Olivia Litterall, Grand Master Hello. of the Order. You ready for this cult brainwashing? You were no, made for well, this topic. I don't. What does that? What does that mean? <laughs> I don't mean you were made to be called brainwashed, but yeah. this is like you, this is your Netflix YouTube yeah, jam. Yeah, that's is it true. Not? My mom always said that if I was <laughs> at the right time in the right place, I probably would have would have been in a cult. You know, you wouldn't have started one. She thinks you just would. Yeah, been like her? she thinks like if I'd been around during Manson, that I would have just would have snatched me right up. <laughs> oh no, that's horrible <laughs> to think. <laughs> She says, when, how, how young were you when she started telling you this? She wasn't, like, telling me from birth, like, oh, yes, my child. <laughs> In a past you life. You would have been a Manson killer. Yeah, like, <laughs> nah. Also, please say hello to Johnny Cook, our patron progenitor. Howdy, howdy. How about you? Would you join a cult, you think? Um, I have to weigh the pros and cons. <laughs> of each yeah. cult or just yes, generally? Yes, of each one. I'd have it like people would present it's to like, me. like, I know I want to join one. I just don't know which yet. Yeah. <laughs> 100% on joining one, but it's just which one? You know, you got to like, I don't know, presentation. Oh, they have to pitch kind. it to you? Like a PowerPoint? Yeah. It's like a meeting yeah, of exactly. being John's cult. And everyone's got their PowerPoint. <laughs> it's like, it's like yeah. a marketing thing. Wow. It's like a marketing thing. Yeah. How many episodes did I need to produce to get you to join this cult? Probably two. I think you just like yelled at him <laughs> in the hallway so and was just like, "Hey, come here!" And he was like, "Yeah." <laughs> he was like, "Do you have a couple episodes I could listen to before I join? I'd like to weigh my <laughs> options." It was a hundred percent of me joining a cult, and Rob was the only one pitching it, so it was kind of. Oh, I had no competition. No. That's right. My name is Dr. Rob C. Thompson. I am your supreme hierophant for today's activities, and uh, let us pledge our way in. Um we the members of the, of the secret, secret order, order of alchemical actors, actors do, do solemnly commit ourselves to a full and honest telling, telling of the history of the occult as far as, far as we, as we know, it. know it. 
All right, Olivia, there's not too much to do, but go ahead and open up that order. Oh, my God, I didn't think about this, but we're opening up, we're opening up, we're opening up the order. See, when, whenever you're here, people wait to hear the lyrics. That's what they're waiting for is what are the lyrics going to be? Yeah, I also am waiting to know what the lyrics yeah, are. Yeah, it's, it's a surprise time. for everybody. It's thrilling. <laughs> So uh, here's the thing. This is the beginning of our summer break. Uh, so we, I guess we're opening up the Order of Confessors to say we have no confessors to announce or reviews, and uh, we won't in the short term. Sorry. It's a little ironic. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, so, <laughs> um, so that's just how it is. Uh, but, but I do want to pitch some things to you, for example, to join our Patreon, uh, where there are countless at this point not countless you can count them but there are a number of bonus episodes olivia's got episodes up on bathory i've got stuff on fallen angels and rock music and we got serial killers up there all sorts of fun things happening on the patreon if you join discord is a thing that we also encourage you to come on over to if you have not joined the discord wonderful community and if you haven't seen what we're up to on youtube go ahead and check that stuff out we are we are a fairly quiet presence on YouTube. Strong but steady. But, uh, st- but we, yes, we are steady. Dan's keeping it, keeping it rolling over there, creating. We're this. the strong, silent type. <laughs> on, on YouTube, not not over here. We are not no, we're silent. Fucking loud here. Close this up, Olivia. We're, oh, I'm committed to that sound. I guess we're closing up. We're closing up. We're closing up the order. It's a little show. Tune. Yeah, I. Yeah, I don't know. I felt like I was parading. Yeah, I don't know. It was a weird one. <laughs> well, it's got I feel like I'm on YouTube. Did you say- I don't know. I don't know how the edits are done exactly, but they needs to be like Kane. Yeah. At the end of that. Hat. Oh yeah. Yeah yeah yeah. Yeah. yeah that- uh, speaking of Allison Mack, right? That was the that was the the mascot for the WB, where I believe her show appeared. Am I am I too old for you guys at this point? Wait, she's not the Smallville. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, she is the one. That was the WB, wasn't it? Or the CB, CW? CW. I was about to say, what's the WB? Yeah, that was but the CW. But the WB is where you watch Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Yeah, CW uh, is like supernatural. I think it became CW after that. Oh. Yeah, anyway, yeah, listeners can write in and let us know about the history <laughs> of these channels. <laughs> CW. <laughs> depending on when you were born and what nerdy shows you were into. On the 5th of June, 2002, a soft-spoken, nicely-dressed man broke into the Salt Lake City home of Edward and Lois Smart. He entered the bedroom of two daughters, 14-year-old Elizabeth and 9-year-old Mary Catherine. He threatened Elizabeth with a knife and got her out of bed. She stubbed her toe on the way out of the room, and he told her to be quiet if she didn't want to get hurt. Mary Catherine attempted to tell her parents, but was nearly caught by the abductor who was standing in the hallway. She hid in her bedroom for two hours before going to her parents' room. At first, they thought that their little girl was just having a nightmare, but then they noticed the cut screen, that is to say the window screen showing how the criminal had come in the house. Elizabeth Smart's kidnapper, Brian David Mitchell, had recently been excommunicated by the Mormon Church for claiming to be the prophet Emmanuel. Dressed in robes in imitation of Jesus, he became a street-corner preacher, panhandling with his third wife, Wanda Barzee, who came to call herself Hefzeba. Mitchell had spent time in Juvenile Hall for exposing himself to a child when he was 16 and was briefly a member of the Hare Krishnas, but had been regularly attending Mormon services before he was kicked out. So a bit of a spiritual seeker, I guess we could say. Yeah, you can't be Hare Krishna and be exposing yourself to children. That's not... Uh, That's a conflict Runs against the ethos. Yeah. That's what that orange robe is for, to prevent all the exposing. Oh, Lord. All right. Mitchell, what? <laughs> no, not you. I'm just oh, okay. sighing at men. So, <laughs> so that was just robes. A... It's a man sigh. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to get worse. But his his wife is involved, I got to say, just for gender equity here. Mitchell and Barty, his wife, had established an encampment outside the city where they brought uh, Elizabeth Smart after Mitchell abducted her. There, they made her change into a robe, washed her feet, and married her to Mitchell, uh, trigger warning here uh, who then raped her to consummate the ritual 
He told her he was an angel and a king and would be martyred and then rise from the dead to do battle with the Antichrist. He claimed she was the first of many virgin brides he would eventually abduct. Smart lived in a tent shackled to a tree where she was regularly abused by Mitchell, sometimes starved, fed garbage, drugged, and shown pornographic magazines. It's just sort of like uh, classic pedophilic behavior, that last one. Oh, I just, it just totally clicked. I think I totally know who Elizabeth what Smart we're is. Yeah. About. Yeah, because he gave, was he like a family friend? Not, not exactly, but you're close. Dude? You're close. They cl- he or something. Yeah, yeah. Like he, they, knew them. he knew yep. them. Cause then he, did the whole alien thing, or not alien or whatever the fuck, right? Let's see. I don't. Know. <laughs> Let's see. Okay. Anyway, so sorry. they called uh, Mitchell and Barzi called Elizabeth Esther, uh, changed her name and concealed her identity with a headscarf and veil when they brought her into public with them. Pretty daring stuff. They went to the Salt Lake City Public Library where a patron took notice of the trio because, you know, it's kind of a weird getup. A police detective came in and interviewed Mitchell who persuaded him that Smart was his daughter and then told him his religion forbade women from speaking in public. The cop was like, all right. In September, they moved to an encampment outside San Diego, making it even less likely that Smart would be recognized. But... The next month, her sister Mary Catherine, who had been haunted since the kidnapping by the sense that the voice of Elizabeth's abductor was a familiar one, finally remembered who that voice belonged to. It was a man calling himself Emmanuel, who'd done odd jobs for the family around the yard. The family described the man to a sketch artist, and his picture was made public. Five months later, in Sandy, Utah, two couples recognized Mitchell from the sketch and police arrested Mitchell and Barzi and rescued Smart. Pretty amazing, really, when you think about all those pieces coming together. Mm-hmm. But but for a few things there, right? She she would still be, or you know, could have gone on. Way to go, that that sister. She was like nine years old. Yeah, but she this this girl ends up just going back and forth, right? Well, it gets weird. So after her abduction. The media promoted a narrative that Elizabeth Smart had been brainwashed. On Good Morning America, Smart's father Edward actually said he thought his daughter had been brainwashed by Mitchell and Barzi. Now, now why would Dad say this about his own daughter? He was attempting to account for why his daughter, hidden up in the hills behind her very own home, didn't respond to searchers passing through the woods calling her name. So all she would have had to say is, hey, I'm here. So he couldn't make sense of why she didn't do that. They were walking right by her. Edward was also speculating as to why Smart hadn't fled during the nine months of her captivity, despite repeated trips to public places. So, you know, if she's in the library, why didn't she just walk off? Or run off? Or, you know, scream, I'm being kidnapped. Commentators anxious to embrace the brainwashing narrative compared Smart to Patty Hearst. You guys know about Patty Hearst? The name sounds familiar. Familiar, Okay, so vaguely. All right, so in 1974, Patty Hearst had been uh, kidnapped by a left-wing guerrilla group called the Symbionese Liberation Army, or the SLA. The SLA wanted to trade her for two members who had been arrested. Instead, Hearst ended up sympathizing with their cause, produced an audio tape saying she joined the SLA, changed her name to Tanya, and helped the SLA to rob a bank. So Patty Hearst, Yikes. she was uh, rich and famous. You know, she was a, uh, an heiress, essentially. So that's why she would have been, you know, good good fodder for such a trade. But then there she is. Okay, because I was wondering why the fuck yeah. her. Yeah, the Hearst, yeah, yeah, why she'd be worth trading for two people. The Hearst, you know the Hearst family, the publications and all that? The Hearsts? No, I don't, not really. I don't know. Just assume <laughs> okay, I don't fine, know. Fair enough. I'm, I'm not, <laughs> this is not an episode about the Hursts, but <laughs> they were. Needless to say, they were very rich, and she was one of them. I um, you. But how how is there a correlation between her and Smart? So I. Cause it's not like she like claimed to join them. No, no, no. She's probably just scared, right? Yes. So in Hurst's case, she did, she actively joined this group and you know committed crimes with them. 
and at her trial for the robbery, she claimed that she had been brainwashed into participating. Later, researchers discovered that she had actually previously identified with a variety of far-left causes. That doesn't rule out the possibility that she may have been coerced, though, by violence or a desire to appease her captors, but she most certainly wasn't brainwashed in the sense of being made to adopt beliefs that she didn't have before the kidnapping. Smart Ridge... Well, go ahead. Is Stockholm Syndrome a thing already? I don't know We're when coming, that was Yeah, like so you're... you're you're right Coined. there with me. Yeah, let, let's talk a little bit about Stockholm Syndrome. Smart, for her part, Elizabeth Smart, coming back to the present day, or, or at least the, the 21st century, rejected the idea that she had been brainwashed into falling in love with her captors. But she was open to the idea that she had a kind of Stockholm Syndrome that involved appeasing her captors to avoid further punishment. The reason she hadn't run away is that she had been tethered. The reason she hadn't spoken up in public is that she feared for her life. She certainly wasn't interested in maintaining ties with Mitchell or his ideas after her rescue. Writing about her experience six years later, Smart said, We all have different ways of getting through our experiences after we come home. One of the ways I did this was to set goals, to work continually toward those goals, and then to set new ones. Finding healthy emotional outlets helped me a lot as well. One of my outlets was playing my harp. She also mentioned her religion, which Mitchell had failed to separate her from, despite his own beliefs. She said, Having religion as part of my life not only helped me understand my trials better and brought me comfort, but it also provided a support group for me from uh, other members of my faith. I, I, I quote Smart at length here, just to demonstrate that as soon as she got away from these people, she went essentially right back to being the person she was before, albeit with trauma that she had to work through. That's all they left her with was trauma, not a new belief system. Mm -hmm. So Stockholm Syndrome, I think Olivia is often misunderstood. We think that it means that uh, you ad 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 adopt the mindset of your captor, uh, but actually what you'd end up doing is um, internalizing this attitude of trying to appease them so that they don't kill or hurt you. It's a it's a self-preservation yeah, survival response yeah and, and i think that's essentially how it functioned for smart with hearst that it may have been similar um but there's the complications of hearst's own beliefs most modern histories of brainwashing ascribe the origins of the idea to psychologists attempting to make sense of captured american soldiers speaking out against the american government during the korean war have you guys either of you come up against this before the beginning of brainwashing as an idea no but weren't people against the war to begin with? The Korean War? Yeah. Well, people have been against every war, John. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, like, wasn't there, like, a large movement? Or am I getting that confused with Vietnam? It's Vietnam, probably. More Vietnam, okay. yeah. In both cases, the United States was attempting to counter communism. The Korean War was about communism, unlike World War Two. Yeah. Um, it became Korea became a kind of proxy space for us to for capitalism versus communism with the Russians and the Chinese backing North Korea, what became North Korea, and the United States backing South Korea. Um, and weren't weren't didn't they have a draft for Korea and Vietnam? Yeah, I mean the Korean draft we've followed right on the tails of World War II. My grandfather uh, was part of the occupation of Japan. Both my grandfather and grandmother technically uh, were in the Korean conflict, um, but they were part of the occupation of Japan. So that's, okay. you know, the end of World War II, but it's also the Korean War. Like, we were occupying Japan in part because, you know, we defeated Japan in World War II, but it's the Korean War because we are actively fighting in Korea, and our outposts in Japan are serving that. Does that answer gotcha. your question? <laughs> yeah, kind of. I'm just, I'm trying to uh, set up maybe, because they, because they were drafted, and I, I don't I because I guess I was getting confused with Vietnam but if there was already a belief that that war was unjust or something like that then them having a platform to speak out I guess makes more sense than if they like signed up for it and then turned around and changed their beliefs as far as a brainwashing goes from my grandparents from my family experience I would say that Korea and Vietnam are different in that Korea because it was on the tails of World War II it was like you joined the army because it was a good thing to do right you were fighting you know for the good cause gotcha. you know you, you very patriotic yeah because you beat the nazis right the army beat the nazis the army beat the japanese who by the way in world war ii were pretty horrible um 
so there was i think this lingering belief into the through the 40s and into the 50s that this was just a, a generally good thing to do you know what i mean okay so there wouldn't be a lot of reason for them to just turn around and start speaking out no i think our complicated relationship with communism started in the late 60s and then into the 70s and then in the 80s it got super weird with iran contra and all that stuff so uh, yeah <laughs> mccarthyism or yeah whatever the, the mccarthyism fuck. of the 50s yeah it, it's all there um but it's not metastasizing into weird foreign conflicts until post-korea necessarily okay both the nazis and the americans attempted to develop techniques for converting enemy captives to their captors ideology and then deploy them as double agents america continued these efforts for 25 years after the war but the results were inconclusive at best the journalist impossible cia operative edward hunter coined the term brainwashing based on the maoist concept of uh, what the chinese call re-education in Korea, as in China, victims weren't re-educated so much as beaten into submission. So we called it, they call it re-education, but it's really just beating the crap out of you. I was going to say, it sounds like conversion. Yeah, I, I, yeah, it, yes. I think that's a good metaphor, Olivia, insofar as you're not going to change anything about that person, who they are underneath. You're just going to beat them into mm -hmm. claiming to agree with you. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Scare them. It's just like any kind of torture. Yeah. Yeah, I mean... Or like or like the old witch trials. They're just going to hurt you until you say what they want you to say. Yes. Yeah. Members of the British military vouched for the brainwashing and the American servicemen, uh, and American servicemen were featured in recordings where they told Americans that they had converted to belief in the superiority of communism and then accused the American government of using chemical weapons against the Chinese and the Koreans. So they, they created these tapes and sent him on home. American GI says America is, you know, gassing the Korea, Koreans, Korean communists, that kind of stuff. The psychologist Robert J. Lifton conducted research on servicemen and Chinese expatriates who had been subjected to indoctrination techniques and concluded that if their thinking had changed in captivity, it returned to normal once they reached the U.S. In other words, they had not been brainwashed in any meaningful way. Only 11 out of 3,000 retained their communist beliefs after their release. 11 out of 3,000. And in-depth interviews with those yeah. 11 revealed that they had communist sympathies before their capture. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm just hammering home this point, and I'm going to keep going, that it's not possible to permanently alter someone's belief system unless they want to go along with you. In China, re-education mm. was and continues to be a kind of dystopian doublespeak, the word re-education. Citizens deemed counter-revolutionary are imprisoned or subjected to forced labor and harsh conditions in order to correct their so-called anti-communist ideas. Uh, just a quick side note here. Uh, I suggest looking up the artist Ai Weiwei, I was literally just yeah. about to mention him. I was like, "Is that is that yeah. the same?" Because he that was China, I, I, right? Yes, he was he's a Chinese artist, oh, uh, kind man. of a bit of a performance artist, bit of a visual artist. He he does different things, um, and he he has this great video on YouTube about what it was like to be in Chinese prison to be re-educated. Uh, he did I watch that for you your, your did, class? Yeah. Is that why <laughs> I? Oh, okay, I was like, because I've definitely he's seen a, that. Is he still yeah, in China? I uh, no, I, I believe he's in the United States now. No. Okay. Yeah, he had to because he was like, it, it it was like an, an intense like. Uh, oh yeah, house, house, house arrest. House arrest. Yeah. Thank you. I was like, what the fuck is that called? I couldn't think of it. <laughs> yeah, the Chinese are very good at that. It's like extreme version of that. And yeah. uh, you know, he he just pissed off the communist government by speaking his mind in his art. And, and that's why they decided they needed to re-educate him. But he was a bold guy. He would go back and forth between, you know, the West and China. Uh, and finally, they just got him. Um, but I would imagine under Xi Jinping that he's uh, a little more reticent to return to China. Xi Jinping does not mess around. The Chinese government is serious these days. Not that they haven't always been, but they actually have. In the 80s, they were much more lax. But, yeah, it's it's gotten real intense. If they no longer express their previous views, that is to say, uh, Chinese counter-revolutionaries, it isn't so much because they no longer hold them as that they fear further punishment. 
During the Korean War, the CIA knew that brainwashing was a myth, but used the term to explain away statements made by prisoners of war against the U.S. military effort. It became a kind of counter-propaganda. Mm. So when the Koreans or, or the Chinese would beat the American soldier into saying, you know, the U.S. does this and the U.S. is evil and all this stuff, then they would ship the tape over. The CIA would like uh, be like, ah, oh, that guy was brainwashed. I've never thought of that yeah. that way. So they didn't believe it. Or that it could be used yeah, that way. This is a yeah. false concept that they were just using to paint a easy narrative to help people digest and dismiss these weird tapes they were seeing. Hmm. The concept of brainwashing has had its most productive life in the West in relation to new or alternative religious movements. So now we're <laughs> we're coming closer to home. It has become a useful tool to make sense of how a seemingly ordinary member of Western society can come to adopt fringe beliefs about the nature of reality and life. In this context, the origin of brainwashing went back almost a century before the Second World War to the rise of Mormonism in the American West. Yes, this is the Mormons' second appearance in today's episode. <laughs> I'm not Gosh. trying to pick on them. I think some many Mormons are lovely people. Um, but in this case, I'm actually going to be quite nice to the Mormons because I think that America treated the early Mormons kind of shabbily. And some of the early Mormons were not so cool, uh, but others were perfectly fine, ordinary people just trying to, to live their lives. Americans have a long tradition of hostility to new religious movements. In truth, humanity has a long tradition going back to the Roman persecution of Jesus and the Christian persecution of Everyone, no, but all the sects it deemed heretical from the Manichaeans to the Lollards. We just love to, we just love to persecute people who have new religious ideas. We're, we're very threatened by them. In the 19th century, the largely Protestant American public was anxious to believe lurid anti-Catholic tales like Maria Monk's imagined tale of rape, infanticide, and murdered nuns at a convent in Montreal. We've shared a full account of Monk's story on this show, as well as the story of Margaret Fox, one of America's first spiritualist mediums who was attacked by a mob in the first days of her public mediumship. So th the stories are just all over the history books uh, of people losing their minds when somebody comes out with an idea about God or the afterlife that they disagree with. People take this very seriously. I guess that's why we have this show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yep. Plug the Patreon. Come on over right there. <laughs> keep keep us going, patrons. You, you keep us talking about things that make people throw bricks at our houses. I don't. <laughs> Please don't Please. throw bricks at Please our houses. Don't. Please. The yeah. Mormons were similarly run out of New York and Illinois. Uh, not I, by that I mean they were run out, not that they were running out of. They were like sprinting. They. Sp Yes, forced they, out. They sprinted from New York, <laughs> yes. and Illinois, before settling in Utah, where they essentially created their own state, far enough away from everyone else to go unbothered, that is, until federal troops came after them. It, yeah, that was part of the whole reason they could really get away with everything is because he just created a, a, his own, like, society with his own cops, his own par like, he, he had everyone. Brigham Young, was, you mean? Was his. It was. No, I'm talking about Warren oh. Jeff. Sorry, <laughs> I'm FLDS, going way in the yes. future. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm back with uh, with Brigham, uh, who was just after Joseph Smith, who died in Illinois. As James R. Lewis points out in his article on the cult controversy, the Mormons posed unique problems for the American public that Catholics did not. Catholics, in monks' telling, had con convents where they confined and physically intimidated nuns to remain with the church, but Mormons roamed free. So this is the beginning. I'm taking you back to the very beginning of belief in brainwashing, brainwashing people into a religious cult. And it's important that you know we make this distinction. We were mad about the Catholics in Protestant America, but we just said, oh, you know, we didn't need brainwashing because we figured that they were locking those nuns up and beating the crap out of them. And that's why they got them to stay nuns. But with the Mormons, nobody was locked away. So why would anyone who was not enslaved or imprisoned follow the Mormon's strange belief system? The answer came in a book, as it often does. That book was Female Life Among the Mormons, a supposedly non-fictional account of a former Mormon convert who went by the name of Maria Ward. Very similar to Maria Monk. <laughs> 
I don't know why that would be, but uh, anyhow. Maria's adventure in Mormonism began in a stagecoach, as everyone's adventure in Mormonism begins, does it not, John? Uh, I would imagine. I would imagine so. I mean, my my uh, journey uh, with occult confession started in a stagecoach. Oh, yes. so. I remember that stagecoach. Well, just assumed. Olivia was driving that, uh, it. She, was, she had a mad look in her eye. Just a mad man. <laughs> yeah. Olivia was whipping <laughs> the horses. Fucking headless yeah. horsemen. I was as... in the back with John opening boxes full of human body parts and showing them to him yes it was it was convincing that's all i can (laughs) say if you join us you can have this lovely ear um (laughs) (laughs) olivia's up there (laughs) yes thunder and lightning our way up the mountain and savannah's cackling from the top of a castle (laughs) <laughs> yep, that yep. was that. It was that was John's first day in the OC. Sold. Everything is black and white. We <laughs> yes. have no idea why. Yes. We were all we were all in black and white. <laughs> Anyhow, Maria's adventure in Mormonism. Back in her stagecoach, uh, she met a man carrying uh, the Book of Mormon, and told him she thought he was deluded. Presaging the concerned families of the 20th century, Maria worried over recent Mormon converts who had left their homes. And poor Miss Maxson was induced to leave her husband and children and go with them. And Maria Ripley, a young woman, left her aged and infirm parent and went off. The man is unbothered and finds these seeming desertions justifiable. Are you then a believer in Mormon? For he that loveth father or mother or husband or wife more than me is not worthy of me. Hardly a fair way of answering a question. I am, or I am not. True. Facts, Here the conversation takes a significant turn. The stranger pauses. Maria says she was at the time unfamiliar with the doctrine of magnetic influence, but she became aware of some unaccountable power being exercised over me by my fellow traveler. His glittering eyes were fixed on mine. His breath fanned my cheek. I felt bewildered and intoxicated and partially at least lost the sense of consciousness and the power of motion. Mm, That's a little... Okay. Are you trying to decide whether or not you buy it? Well, John, did that happen to you when I was showing you those body parts and Olivia was driving us up the side of the mountain? Uh, that's what I remember. Were you intoxicated but by it all? I was a little intoxicated. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the stagecoach stops to change horses. The pair go into an inn to warm themselves. The stranger tells her he wants to stay with her and fixes her with a spell like a snake charmer that she struggles to release herself from, even to glance out the window. The stagecoach leaves without them, and the man, a Mr. Ward, informs her that the Mormons are to have a meeting in this particular town this very night. So begins Maria's descent into female Mormonhood. But the journey began and was abetted by the 19th century equivalent of a brainwasher, a Mormon mesmerist. I'm sorry, but... This 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 bit this sounds like she was sex trafficked borderline. <laughs> like yeah. if you just like listen to it like like she's she gets there, the stagecoach leaves, he's like, now nah, we're staying, got a spell over her, he's all up in her face and sparkling and shit. <laughs> I don't <laughs> what the hell I mean that's the sparkling is the operative thing here. I mean the stagecoach leaves not by accident, but you know he mesmerizes her into choosing not to follow the stagecoach. When when the American says, "Okay, well, <laughs> yeah, right, right, I mean exactly." That's you know, okay. It, 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 these nineteenth-century Americans are saying, "Why would anybody be Mormon?" And Maria is saying, "Because magic, because magic mind control. That's the only re- that's the only way to account for people following this." <laughs> okay, sure. So let's jump forward to the anti-cult movement, or ACM. Olivia, you are very familiar, yes? The anti-cult movement. Children of God, Unification Church, all that stuff. Yeah, the the ACM directly poses themselves in opposition. So this was organized in the 1970s as a result of family members of so-called cult converts attempting to get their loved ones back. Oh, okay. On the... On the so same page. We're, for the we're religious here. organizations they had joined. So 
families of uh, unification or children of God converts read about each other in the newspaper. So you would post an ad in the newspaper, my son has joined the unification church. I don't know what mm-hmm. to do. And then other people would read it. Or you, you, know, you have the article in the newspaper, you know, parents beside themselves with grief over daughter who ran off to join the children of God and now has sex for Jesus. Uh, and you know, people read right. about these stories and they're like, oh, we should get together because we're all sad about the same thing. Group therapy. I was going to say, if that if that stuff was still being put in the newspaper, I might actually <laughs> read one. <laughs> about cults and stuff. Those were the days. The 70s were the fun times, John, to be reading a newspaper. In 19... 19- I'll take your word for it. <laughs> you weren't doing a lot of other yeah, things. You, you get to read about the Amityville horror <laughs> and get to read about... I don't know. Jimmy Carter running for president. In 1972, he was a peanut farmer. He was a good time. In 1972... <laughs> these people formed parents to free our sons and daughters from the children of god that is p-t-f-o-s-a-d-f-l-f-t-c-o-g they should work on a shorter (laughs) name Uh, uh, the major this was the first major acm organization the focus on the children of god proved too narrow and the group expanded in 1974 to target other religious movements and renamed itself the citizens freedom council there you go olivia there we go yep that's this had a better. new focus on the far more popular unification church, also called the Moonies. These groups had two primary goals, to rescue people recruited into these religious groups and to discredit these so-called cults. So, Olivia, was go ahead. Unif- oh, sorry, was unification cult? Is that the guns? Is that that no, one? No, no, no. No. They're not especially violent. They had the mass weddings, the unification church. That's what they're most known for. Oh, they do end up getting crazy about no, I, guns, You know right? more than me, maybe. No. I don't I watched a documentary a long time ago, but I could They be had political saved. motivations, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like, well, we'll okay. get there. You, you can throw the guns in wherever you think they go. <laughs> well, <laughs> let's, let's put our guns away right now. But that's all. I think you're thing. right, Olivia, though, that, you know, therapy-wise, it's good for people who are having this experience, parents to come together and sympathize with each other, but when it comes to all these other activities, that's a whole other kettle of fish. If you're going to try to do things about other people's choices, I don't know. That's sort of like, you know, you get together because you, you know, with loved people who've lost a loved one, and then you decide, oh, maybe we should just raise them from the dead, you know, (laughs) rather than getting, you know, trying to work Mm. through these feelings. Let's do something about it. But hey, if they're uh, being brainwashed. Uh, that's the idea. This is totally, unification is exactly, I just looked it up, it's they, what I thought it was. They like, end up going crazy about hmm. fucking guns. That's news to me. I, I, haven't, I haven't done much work on unification, um, but what what do you mean? Like they just st- stockpile them, Waco style? I'm trying to remember. <laughs> they end up, it's like, it turns, because once it like passed down from that guy and his wife Moon. to like, yeah, I passed down to like his son, I think, or something, oh, or one of them. That's when it got gun crazy. And then, yeah, like they all like bring their guns and shit. The ACM yeah. depended on belief in brainwashing to make sense of what they were doing, since freedom of religious belief is a fundamental premise of modern Western thought. And they could not make their case to the government or to the public based on the idea that they were questioning or undermining their family members' right to choose their own religious affiliations. Their converted sons or daughters, they said, hadn't chosen freely to join the Unification Church or the Hare Krishnas or the Children of God. They had been brainwashed against their will. You see, so you can't make a good public relations case. You can't make a good legal case that people can't choose their own religion. That's some that's as American as apple pie. Or guns. Sorry. Uh, deeply sorry. This is not only justified. Uh, this not only justified the ACM's crusade, but their technique for curing the hypnotized convert. Counter brainwashing, also known as, you know, Olivia, D. De- Sensitization or something. Desensitization is what happens know. when you watch too many 1980s horror movies. Oh, or porn. <laughs> or, yeah, or too many right. porn. <laughs> 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 just imagine the, you know the, the couple at the computer and they got the port on and then the guy turns to the girl and he's like ah damn she's like what what happened he's like i got desensitized it's uh 
<laughs> Except for me. It's over. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Flew too close to the sun. Um, <laughs> One too many. <laughs> One too many. Imagine if that happened with like alcohol. Anyway. It oh, kind of does. Oh, they have gun blessing services Okay, so shit. this is for real. Sorry. The Unification Church did bless guns. Okay. Yeah, because their logo is like... Is a gun now? Two guns That's crossing, madness. I think, now. That's These horrifying. intense psychological yeah. exercises of deprogrammer, de- de- deprogramming or counter brainwashing were not only valid, they said, uh, but could be forced on so-called victims since their conversion was not voluntary. So if you had been forced to adopt your strange beliefs in your cult, then the deprogrammer was justified in taking them away from you by force if necessary. This is all highly legally suspect. Because these are adults. We're talking only about adults here. And grabbing adults, kidnapping adults away from the group they have voluntarily joined, and then forcefully deprogramming them. Initially, the ACM, in the form of various loosely related groups, felt free to abduct people away from the groups they had joined in order to subject them to deprogramming. deprogramming. But as I'm saying, the ACM groups didn't do the deprogramming themselves. They referred people out to professionals in the business. Police looked the other way, deeming these cases to be family issues. But civil liberties groups and the religious organizations themselves pushed back. In response, the ACM promoted the use of conservatorships generally reserved for allowing family members to handle the legal affairs for an elderly or incapacitated loved one. Britney Spears, of course, the most famous case of a conservatorship that recently has been terminated. Hashtag bless. (laughs) Yes. Amen. The ACM contended that cult brainwashing uh, was cause for granting parents conservatorship over their adult children. And this very briefly became the means for continuing the practice of forced deprogramming. The use of conservatorships was brief because they were successfully challenged by court cases. Many of those court cases financed by the Unification Church. Don't mess with the Unification Church with them guns on their logo. And deprogramming was extremely expensive, making it unavailable for all but the most affluent ACM parents. Remember, your therapist, you are hiring a therapist who is not really a therapist, but is acting and charging like a therapist to go into somebody's house, abduct them, bring them to their own residence, and then spend days or weeks deprogramming them forcefully. There was like a guy that became really famous for it, right? Oh, there were a few, yeah. They ended up on all the Sally Jesse yeah. Raphael's and all them talk shows. Yeah. Did it like did it work though? Mm. <laughs> Interesting you ask that, Sean. <laughs> Tales about abusive and questionably scientific deprogrammers began to discourage parents from availing themselves of their services and the act of deprogramming fell out of favor. The ACM began as a counter-organization to oppose the Unification Church, also known as the Moonies, after their founder, the Reverend Sun Myung Moon. Uh, that's, that's, what they call, that's why they were called the Moonies, because of the Reverend Moon. In 1936, Moon received a vision of Jesus, asking him to complete Jesus' work. And after World War II, he began preaching this new message in his home country of Korea. Moon first sent missionaries to Japan and the United States in 1958 and 1959 before he moved to the U.S. in 1971. His gatherings at Madison Square Garden, Yankee Stadium, and the National Mall in Washington, D.C. drew hundreds of thousands of people. He taught that Jesus' purpose on earth had been to reestablish Eden, an earthly paradise, and that humans could work toward that goal by performing good works to cancel the effects of sin. Eve, he said, was sexually seduced by Satan creating a contaminated bloodline that Moon removed members from through a blessing given in a mass wedding ceremony comprised of couples who initially were personally matched by Moon. So that's the the mass Mm. weddings. No guns involved in any of this yet, Olivia, so I guess that must be further down the road. Mm -hmm. I definitely remember the videos of the mass weddings and, like, that shit was like like mass weddings. Yeah. I think at one point they were doing like it was like a like hundred like a shit yeah, ton of people. You could see in the Madison like, Square Garden, like these big places, they would fill these places. Yeah, and you just met this person because you were matched by the Reverend himself. Ugh, it's like E Harmony. <laughs> That's not a good look for E Harmony. 
Moon Harmony. Moon. Writing in 1979, the scholars Anson Shoup and David Bromley argued that what made the Unification Church so threatening, as well as the Hare Krishnas and the Children of God, by the way, was the degree to which they sought st sweeping structural change. So all of these groups were trying to change the culture. By contrast, transcendental meditation, for example, with its focus on individual change, was far less threatening. Because transcendental meditation, you know, you just like meditate, maybe you levitate, it make you feel better, be better. But they're not like... That's not going to yeah, hurt anyone. It's not going to hurt anybody. But, you know, with, with Moon saying, you know, we're going to change the world and purge... With Moon saying we're going to change the world and purge sin and saying, you know, he, he's saying we're going to change... You know, children of God, Olivia, you know these folks, they were you, challenging mm -hmm. a lot of sexual taboos. Uh, they were... Uh, going out and c converting people in bars and stuff. It, it was it, far more aggressive. Yeah, those dudes suck. The Hare Krishnas yeah. in the airports. like it's just, These are just more aggressive groups. As opposed to TM, which is not threatening at all. This may help to explain why, even in the 2000s, Ranieri's Nexium went largely unbothered for a very long time, and why it took many decades for anybody to get very upset about Scientology. Let us remember Scientology. Mm -hmm. Scient like, we all lost our minds over Scientology, what, like six years ago or something? Because that's like, that's the success story right that's the that's the big one but we just ignored them essentially like but for a handful of scholars up until very recently nobody bothered the scientologists although they were in court so to try much. to get their uh status their church status right or just like various like just little like they like they were constantly like somehow like in the spotlight but like not yeah. in the spotlight in a way that's like people weren't trying know. to take them down nobody was infiltrating them the way we were with the moonies or yeah i guess that's why i'm like that's like the yeah. prototype like that's the that's the success story and ranieri i think was essentially trying to replicate scientology because both of them at their heart are non-academic psychological exercises you know what I mean? they're, they're a kind of therapy both of yeah. them are a kind of therapy well they're more like spiritual than like god e if that like religious yeah they, yeah I, I know what you mean uh, there's not so much a god talk it's not yeah it's more like a spiritual therapy it's therapeutic technique yeah. Yeah, like the whole like auditing. Yeah, and, yeah, blah, yeah. Blah, blah, and Nexium you know? is essentially like a, it feels like a kind of like spiritual yeah. corporate training, basically. Yeah. The Unification Church, in contrast to Scientology and Nexium, challenged important assumptions underpinning the social order, namely Moon's reinterpretation of Christianity and rethinking of Western marriage arrangements. Like if you think about those weddings and the fact that he's setting up these you know marriages and they're being done in this very unusual way that threatens the social fabric we that bothers us if nexium's just holding like a weird conference in a hotel whatever it's not as yeah interface. those are it's a little self contained and it's almost of. like in case it, for ranieri and the scientologists they're kind of following they're they're not breaking the mold. Ranieri's just going to these hotel rooms and you know, or wherever these conference centers and holding conferences, which you know I go to. I go to conferences. <laughs> you know, mm. people go to seminars and stuff, get rich quick or whatever. That's a that's a big part of American culture. He's not breaking the mold in any way there. Yeah, well, and with the Unification Church, I think like they also really like nailed in the coffin i sent you like the article yeah. for it but it's just like a vox article but it like they tried to have like a a whole gun thing right at their place which is right near it was either like an elementary Ugh. school or like a middle yeah. school and so then people lost their shit because it was like oh well you've gone too far out of your your bounds and now you're in our they bounds intentionally court you know what i mean yeah. He defined religion to encompass science, education, and politics, which made Moon's ideas even more potentially transformative and anticipated an imminent return to paradise and promised widespread change to existing systems. This is all threatening the culture. All right, now I, I'm going to speculate here. Uh, 
but I think at this point I'm entitled. <laughs> I've done my research, so allow me to speculate. You have a PhD. I, I do. I do not in, specifically in this, but it's pretty close to this stuff. Nah, yeah, that's like a speculation. Yeah, license. it's a license to speculate in the neighborhood of religion for sure. Yeah. I suspect. Our recent fascination with individual focused movements like Nexium and Scientology. Remember, like, these are our obsessions now. We make multiple documentary series about Nexium. They're the cover of the New York Times. Scientology has gotten huge book treatments and documentaries. And, you know, when some celebrity decides to quit Scientology, it's national news. We're suddenly, we suddenly really care about these individual focus movements. And I think this has its roots in the rise of the individual as the focus of social media in particular. Follow me here. Mm. The individual's capacity to go viral and exert cultural influence outside the traditional gatekeepers of the culture makes cults that exclusively corrupt individuals more interesting or threatening than they used to be. Certainly, passionate YouTubers and Twitter posters seem to be able to get people from all corners of, corners of the world to believe all sorts of bizarre things just because those people believe them. See, for example, any of our QAnon stuff. In addition to social media, I'd also toss in mass shootings as another inspiration for a newfound interest in psychologically focused cults. Mass shootings are a largely but not uniquely American phenomenon. Here, a single human being with a psyche uniquely twisted by any combination of loosely connected or unrelated beliefs, belief systems can have a terrible impact on dozens, hundreds, or even thousands of people's lives. Gun rights advocates often enough will exacerbate this concern by turning the conversation back on the psychological issues that led to the shooting. Oh, video games. Uh... Or mental illness. Most recently, they're just like, yeah. oh, it's evil. Evil is causing this to happen. But these guys are all espousing beliefs or broadcasting their actions on the internet. Yeah. They're adopting beliefs. They're being encouraged by the internet, you know, by these social media chat... I almost said chat rooms. <laughs> <laughs> show and your age it's all okay. these guys in 1999 keep <laughs> encouraging them an AOL <laughs> encouraging <laughs> and yeah I mean you, did you did you see the uh, the new Batman movie go on no I, because I because that was that was really prevalent the, the capacity of the social movie. social media to encourage dark deeds yes individuals yes. I mean it's encouraging an individual to do dark deeds I think that that are, could be nationally traumatic and so a group need not be attempting a mass social transformation on the order of the free loving communal children of God or vaguely apocalyptic unification church in order to get us excited and worried the threat of individual psychological transformation is now enough to worry a society where any anonymous person can become an internet celebrity overnight. Do you, you, you buy that? I think that's a really, I never would have thought about it that way. I think it's like, it's a really interesting way to think about like that we are just like in general, like people, especially like my age are so much more focused on themselves and like self help i guess for a lack of a better term so that is what would draw in people yeah. now to like a group is not so much like the fear of god but like hey like come to this class where you will help yourself through this spiritual x y and z like that i could see so many people i know just being like yeah <laughs> like, but something like a children of God know. was like, oh, we're gonna have this commune and create a whole new way of life and all this sort of stuff. It's less right, appealing, it's... do you think? Or even just like this being born into it, like and, and all that, like that that is like a whole different type of quote, like you know, ba brain rot, like washing, yeah, yeah. I guess, like the sort of like self advancement versus safety and fear kind of thing. Right. Well, and I guess then it's fear keeps you there, right? Once you're but, in. It, but, but I mean, it, the, the comparison I'm making is the new school and the old school, that the old school cult, quote unquote cult, uh, is about social change. And the new school cult is about individual change. 
or at least the cults that threaten. Yeah. And, and I'm using... Uh, even if you look at people like Jim Jones, you know, he started off being, like, super socialist. Yeah. Like, that was, like, his whole thing. And, like, people joined him because they wanted to do acts of kindness and, like, you know, what they, you know, quote, socialism, unquote. Yeah. But... Now we don't need to those that kind of stuff. We don't get into that kind of stuff. Politics is maybe too alienating for people, you know, mm. that kind of stuff. That that broad social change argument isn't as appealing as it used to be. It's it's about you, changing you. I'm not saying that's yeah. good or bad, but I am saying that the change in the focus of the society has resulted in a change in what we consider threatening and cult-like behavior. The way we define a cult now encompasses that individual focused stuff in ways that it wouldn't have in the 70s necessarily Mm -hmm. most famous among the community of psychologists supporting the brainwashing and deprogramming theory was a woman named margaret singer or is i should say singer evaluated patty hearst during her trial and concluded that she had been transformed into a low affect zombie but her testimony was never heard by the jury because the prosecution successfully argued that brainwashing had never been admitted as an explanation in a criminal trial before in an article for psychology Mm. today singer said that cults used conditioning techniques and devalued reason to maintain the loyalty of their members As the head of an American Psychological Association task force, she attempted to have her theories of brainwashing, which she called deceptive and indirect techniques of persuasion and control, formalized. But the APA rejected the task force's proposal, saying that their recommendations lacked scientific rigor. One of the voices opposing Singer was none other than religion scholar J. Gordon Melton, best known to our listeners as the author of The Biographical Dictionary of American Cults and Sect Leaders. Writing... (laughs) Yeah, this is cool, isn't it? Writing in 1999, Melton said, Since the 1980s, though a significant public belief in cult brainwashing remains, the academic community, including scholars from psychology, sociology, and religious studies, have shared an almost unanimous consensus that the coercive, persuasion, brainwashing thesis proposed by Margaret Singer and her colleagues in the 1980s is without scientific merit. And I will let J. Gordon Melton have the last word on this subject john and olivia any thoughts from you before we close it out i I would be curious i would be curious to see when that shift that you're talking about happened but from the the threat being from the social change groups to the individual change groups in the 90s but it's facebook and that and youtube and like what we're doing now like we started a podcast (laughs) you know like think about what we do how many people we reach and how many people we talk to these opinions go much further than they did or would have in the past and there's no gatekeeper for me for for us we can say whatever we want we didn't need to get hbo's approval or abc Mm -hmm. or nbc or you know it used to be that you needed some kind of rich studio to stamp your project now we can talk to twenty thousand people and nope, just, we just can, you know. So it sounds like it sounds like social media was a thing, not necessarily the internet, because I mean chat rooms. Well, they, yeah, were was kind of self-contained. I don't think chat rooms could bit. go on the level of an, like an, an Instagram influencer with you know fifty thousand followers or a hundred thousand followers. You know, a chat room couldn't accomplish yeah. that. It, the social media really did that, and then YouTube and podcasting can have a similar effect, I believe. I would say, though, one thing is that, like, social media is, like, for all its faults in the matter, it it is more, like, regulated than those early, like... Oh, yeah. Yeah, I agree. Chat rooms or forums or, like, whatever the fuck. Like, not that it's still well-regulated now because, like, obviously it's not because, like, even, you know, with all the mass shootings recently, like, there's plenty of warning signs on the internet not even warning signs but like there's an attempt to regulate i think that didn't exist right i i i want to keep people on the line here i i want to i don't want anybody to be off the hook i I want (laughs) 
I because I don't having done this research, I do not believe that anybody can say I was brainwashed or I was del, uh, you know I was misled. You were misled because you wanted to be. You believed in QAnon because you chose to. You know what I mean? Yeah. The internet didn't make you do it. You chose these beliefs, right. and you had a, you had a, how many options do you have? Like in this show alone, we've given you like eighty different belief systems that you can pick from. You picked the one that you know caused you to do some horrible thing, like storm the Capitol or hurt people or hurt yourself. And it sucks, but yeah. we're personally responsible to a large extent for these choices. It's not like you don't have any information. Yeah. We've all got the same information it, the when it comes down to it. Maybe there are traumas or things that have happened in your life, and, and we can say, you know, there's a reason why you were susceptible or why you made these choices, but you you still made the you choice. You still made the choices. Yeah. Though. Right. And then when the parents, I guess, what I'm getting at is, you know, get up there and basically defend their kid, you know, they can say that they're not, but when you sit there and you're like, they did it because of this and that and this and that and all these things that are supposedly not a, in the person's control. And it's like, no, yeah. I, I don't know. But, you know, the one of the moms of the Columbine you know, shooters was doing the same thing back in the day. Yeah, it goes you know, back to the original. Publicly defending, publicly defending her son, you know. Yeah, I don't know. I think you're right. I don't know if I made my point at all. They're not listening to the female anymore. Were they ever? <laughs> oh, the females. Our sources today included James R. Lewis's Apostates and the Leg Legitimation of Repression, Historical and Empirical Perspectives on the Cult Controversy, Elizabeth Aileen Young's Use of Brainwashing Theory by the Anti-Cult Movement, Brainwashing and Cults, The Rise and Fall of a Theory by J. Gordon Melton, Anson D. Shoup and David Bromley's The Moonies and the Anti-Cultists, Female Life Among the Mormons, a narrative of many years' personal experience by the wife of a Mormon elder recently from Utah, published in 1863, and Elizabeth Smart's uh, portion of You're Not Alone, The Journey from Abduction to Empowerment. Olivia, bring us on home. I hereby adjourn and declare close this meeting of the Secret Order of Alchemical Actors till such a time as we get together and do it again. My name is Dr. Robert C. Thompson, joined by Johnny Cook, patron progenitor. See ya. Olivia Literal, our master of the order. Sorry for getting political if Rob kept it in. <laughs> so, <laughs> here's where we're at. We're going around the world with this series. Uh, we're going to touch on a variety of groups. We've got Falun Gong coming. We've got Aum Shinrikyo. We've got Nation of Islam. We have the neo Nazi occult. Uh, so, so, we're leaving. Uh, I'm not going to say we're leaving no stones unturned because when it comes to violent cults, there are a variety of them. But that's really the that's the rubric i guess for me when when i picked which groups i wanted to talk about i wanted to make sure i was picking groups number one that hadn't already been podcasted to death <laughs> mm. you know like jim jones uh, but number two i wanted to pick groups that intentionally preached violence against others now falun gong is the exception there and when we do that episode the chinese accused falun gong the chinese government of of doing harm to others but i don't think there's really a strong case to be made there that was propagandistic um but that helps us i think that helps to define our terms here so that's what we, we we're talking about with dangerous cults this series uh and and now we've got our theory of brainwashing out of the way we can get into some specific cases here on occult confessions